I'm Wilson. And I call myself a product designer. But I say that somewhat sheepishly because I don't design the kind of products like this that live in the real world. I design products like this that live on screens. And I can sometimes have something of an inferiority complex comparing myself to people like architects or industrial designers who make things that have a much more tangible um, impact. But lately I've been trying to make the case, and I'll try again today to make the case, um, that the things that we build for screens, um, while they may not have such a visible impact on our built environment, um, that they're just as important, if not in some cases more important, in terms of their impact on how we live and who we are. So speaking of the real world, this is my house. This was my house. This is where I grew up. It was built in 1886. And as a kid, my friends said I lived in a museum. Um, I was surrounded by collections, Victorian furniture, musty old books, bicycles, cars, printing presses, musical instruments, stereo equipment, and computers. When my father died, all of these things, his things, resurfaced suddenly into my life. He loved cars. This is the car he bought after his first chemo treatment because he said, no one's going to tell the professor with cancer that he can't drive a Porsche. <laughs> this is the car he drove when he brought me home from the hospital after I was born. When I was a kid, he collected classic cars. They reminded him of the cars he dreamed about when he was young. When money got tight, this is the one car he didn't sell because I begged him to keep it. I drove it to my senior prom. And I told him if it was my car someday, I would never sell it. We put so much of ourselves into these things, but they're just things. They're just tools. They fulfill a need. They take us where we want to go. But they're also sort of totems, symbols of ourselves. They're empty vessels. We fill them up with our stories. They're constantly changing to reflect our desires, our hopes for the future, and our best image of ourselves. We shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. This is a line from Marshall McLuhan, another college professor like my dad. It's from his book, Understanding Media, which came out in 1964. It's about electronic media, especially television, and how they affect our society and culture. One of the things he says is that the things we make, whether it's a TV or radio or a telephone, <laughs> each of these things creates a new environment. When you introduce a new medium, this is one of McLuhan's favorite terms. You've sure, I'm sure you've heard his most famous phrase, the medium is the message. Um, but when you introduce a new medium into a society, McLuhan says it changes our outlook, changes our attitudes about how we relate to the world, changes our feelings about things like politics, about war. Even a light bulb, which has no content, but a light bulb still acts as a new medium. It creates a new environment. It lengthens the workday. It changes how and when people can interact. It changes how we behave. The car is one very noticeable example of this kind of environmental effect. The car may look very different on the outside, but as a machine, it hasn't changed that much in 100 years. But look at how we change the world around it. We built highways, factories, oil companies. 
We changed our whole environment based on the car. We changed our whole way of living. And McLuhan's ideas kind of go in and out of fashion. And it's a cliche to say this, but I really believe they've never been as relevant as they are now. Um, but they're a little bit hard to explain secondhand because the way he communicated them was so unique and idiosyncratic. He was a big believer in combining words and images and wordplay and even music all kind of in the service of um, communicating an idea. So I put together a, a little video um, with some of his words in the first part. It's not his voice, but it's from his writing. And well, I'll let you uh, see if you can recognize the voice in the second part. All media are extensions of some human faculty, mental or physical. The wheel is an extension of the foot. The book is an extension of the eye. Clothing is an extension of the skin. Electric circuitry is an extension of the central nervous system. The extension of any one sense displaces the other senses and alters the way we think, the way we see the world, and ourselves. When these changes are made, men change. I think one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, that didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. That last clip is from a balloon that those guys made. And they sent a digital camera up with it. And they tracked it with their iPhones so they could find it when it landed. But they took pictures from space. I, I just think that's amazing. Um, you might recognize that clip and some of the other clips from around the web. I'm very grateful to their original creators for the permission to share them with you uh, today. And I'll share a link at the end um, with credits for all of them. Maybe you recognize the voice of Steve Jobs there at the end. I just love that idea about computers. They're like a bicycle for our minds. It's such a great way to think about tools, that they're this empowering, almost bionic extension of our own human abilities. This was the first computer I ever used, an Apple IIe. I learned to read on that computer, a game called Reader Rabbit. But I also learned to make things. 
Never had very good handwriting as a kid, but I copied every game out of this book, line for line, and typed it into that computer so that I could play it back. And usually, we didn't have a disk to copy it on, so every time I wanted to play it, I had to type it in again. I was never very good at drawing, but I spent hours drawing on the screen with a, a program called Logo, which was sort of a computer language developed for education. But it was real time. You typed in the commands, and it would move a cursor on the screen, and you could, you could draw little pictures um, by programming on the screen. Later, we had a Mac. And if the Apple IIe was my childhood, um, I think I really fell in love with making things on the computer with the Mac. When I was nine or 10 years old, my dad got me a game called Cosmic Osmo. It came on about 14 floppy disks. <laughs> and I thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. It started with a spaceship that just sort of appeared on screen and you just had to figure out that you could click on it. And you'd click on it, and it would bring you a little bit closer. And then you'd click again, and the door would open. And that was it. You just kept clicking around and exploring and finding new things in what, to a nine-year-old kid, um, felt like an endless set of possibilities, an endless world. But eventually, those 14 disks ran out. And I wanted more. So I convinced my dad to buy me a copy of the software called HyperCard that they used to make this game. And I started learning how to use it and making my own games. Miraculously, I was able to find one other person my age who was doing the same thing. We met at summer camp. This is before the internet. Um, and we would send floppy disks back and forth in the mail with our unfinished games on them and you know, write each other letters back and forth with our, you know, our feedback, our very sophisticated critique of all of the philosophical themes that I'm sure you can imagine two 11-year-old boys put in the <laughs> games that they were making. I didn't realize it then, but all that time with HyperCard making these games thinking about you know, the flow of uh, the path through these sort of virtual spaces um, turned out to be pretty good practice when the web showed up a few years later. And so when I, when I was in high school, that was what I played with, um, making web pages. Even though I was only 14 or 15, in 1995, I had just as much experience with the web as anybody else in the world. So I figured out that I could actually make some money doing it. And that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> the thing that I did, played around with in my free time when I was 11 years old is the thing I get paid to do every day. Um, so I think that's a pretty good metric for job satisfaction. So I started out on this thing, typing things into this box to make it go. And then in this box, and then others after it, and so on. But things have changed in the last few years in an interesting way um, for the things that I make. The things I make don't just live on these boxes anymore. They live on all these screens, on all these devices. Phones and tablets and TVs. And I used to have to put floppy disks in the mail to share what I was working on with someone. And now I can do that anywhere there's a screen. And that's all it is, a screen. The computer is nothing. It fits in the palm of your hand. And the network is invisible. It's wireless. But the thing that is left, the thing that we still can see and interact with, is the screen. When we think about the future, in science fiction, screens are everywhere. We imagine a world where everyone wakes up, goes to work, goes to sleep, surrounded by screens. 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, this still seemed futuristic, maybe a little disturbing. But if we look around, it's not that far from how we live. Think about it. 
What's your time to screen in the morning? How long does it take you to go from being asleep to being in front of a screen? How much more downtime do you spend in front of a screen? Waiting for the bus, reading Kindle on the train, curled up on the couch with an iPad. The car shaped the environment of the 20th century in this huge tectonic way. It's hard to imagine what the world would look like if the car didn't exist. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that the screen will be just as important to shaping our environment in the 21st century. So what goes on those screens is important. The things we choose to surround ourselves with will shape what we become. It's not just about pretty interfaces. We're in the process of building an environment where we'll spend most of our time for the rest of our lives. How do we want to spend that time? What do we want it to feel like? What do we want to feel like? Somebody once told me that the internet effectively gives us three superpowers. More or less, we can communicate with anyone in the world. We can find any piece of known information and we have access to infinite processing power. Through the network, I can access the processing power of millions of computers for just as long as I need it. And all of this I can do from anywhere. My connection to these, well, except for here. <laughs> and doesn't that make this a wonderful place? But my connection to these superpowers is always on. I carry it with me. The third generation of data and voice communications, the convergence of mobile phones and the internet, high-speed wireless data access, intelligent networks, and pervasive computing will shape how we work, shop, pay bills, flirt, keep appointments, conduct wars, keep up with our children, and write poetry in the next century. That's Steve Silberman writing in Wired Magazine in 1999. To us in this room in 2012, that doesn't sound like the future. That's just the world we live in. But it didn't take a century. It barely took a decade. Alexis Madrigal, writing in The Atlantic this year, said, I can take a photo of a check and deposit it in my bank account, then turn around and find a new book through a Twitter link and buy it, all while being surveilled by a drone in Afghanistan and keeping track of how many steps I've walked. The question is, as it always has been, now what? Now that we have these superpowers, what do we do with them? And what do they make us? With great power comes great responsibility, right? So I share a responsibility with other designers to think about the impact of the things that we make not just how they meet our goals or our clients' goals, but how they shape our behavior. But all of us share a responsibility as we learn how to navigate and live in this digital world to be aware of how we relate to our tools and the impact that they have on us. There's a line about architecture from John Ruskin. He said, when we build let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. We don't tend to think about the things that we build for screens lasting very long. Websites and apps have a short half-life. Even the longest lasting platforms and operating systems are a blip on the timeline 
compared to a house or a car or a chair. The things we make can have such short lives. And I think that makes us short-sighted. Sometimes our imaginations don't stretch that far ahead. Or we don't look that far behind us for inspiration. So that's my big do. To remember, as I join a lot of you and a lot of other designers, creating this new ecosystem of digital tools in this world of screens, that we have a longer horizon ahead of us than just the next software platform or the next version of the technology. And we have a longer lineage behind us than just the web or software or even computers. Steve Jobs said that the, things that, the thing that separates us from the high primates is that we're tool builders. We make things. We make things that change our lives, and we make things that change our world. This is a long and long-lasting tradition. We shape our tools, and our tools shape us. We're a product of our world, and our world is made of things. The things we use, the things we love, the things we carry with us, and the things we make. We're the product of our world, but we're also its designer. Design is the choices we make about the world we want to live in. We choose where to live, what to surround ourselves with, what to focus our time and energy on. We make our world what it is, and we become the kind of people that live in it. When we're gone, all that's left of us is what we've made. Not everything we make leaves a visible footprint on the earth. But everything we make takes up space, creates noise competes for attention. What do we want to spend more time with? What do we want to shape us? What nourishes us? What do we want to see grow? I think we all have an idea. I think we all have something that we want to make for no other reason than we want it to exist. Something small, but meaningful. That's my little do for all of us. Let's go make things. Let's find what we love and find out how to make more of it. Let's make things that nudge the world a little bit in what we hope is the right direction.